I am Lauren Bennett. I am the lead product engineer on the Spatial Stats team, so we work on the tools that we're going to be showing you today. Um, this is my colleague, Flora Vale. She is uh, an honorary member of the Spatial Stats team, um, but also responsible for um, building charting and other visualization capabilities into Pro, um, which is a really important part of kind of how we visualize the output of our tools. Um, so we're really excited as those capabilities continue to grow. Um, and this is Janora DaCosta. She is a real member of the Spatial Stats team <laughs> and uh, responsible for our documentation. So it's a lot of responsibility on her shoulders. Um, and we're all really excited to talk to you about space-time pattern mining and space-time um, data analysis. Um, these are, this is really some of the newest stuff we've been working on over the last few years. And um, they are tools that, it's really just the beginning. We have kind of created this framework that's going to make it possible for us to do all sorts of things in terms of space-time analysis. So we'll talk to you about what's possible now. And, you know, we're always looking for feedback on what else you'd love to do or be able to do, what other questions you'd like to be able to answer using um, the space-time pattern mining tools. So, in our in space in our spatial data mining one session, which was right before lunch, um, we talked a lot about quantifying spatial clusters. We specifically talked about hotspot analysis and cluster outlier analysis and how those work, and the idea that it's all about looking at at our um, spatial neighbors and figuring out if our local average is different enough from our global average, average to be a hot spot or a cold spot, or in the case of cluster and outlier analysis, also looking for high and low outliers. So we do a lot, I mean, we all think a lot about looking for these kinds of spatial patterns. And they are incredibly powerful, and they tell us all sorts of things about um, the data that we're looking at. But they are missing one thing, and that's time. So how do we incorporate time into our analysis? There are a couple of ways that people traditionally do it, um, perfectly valid ways. And we still do stuff like snapshot analysis. So here, we're looking at. Um, snapshots, one in January of 2015, one in January of 2016. In this case, we're looking at 911 calls in Baltimore. So um, we can look at these two maps side by side, start to see if we think that there's any major changes. Maybe we would, could run a hotspot analysis on the 2015 data and one on the 2016, see if any changes have happened there. Um, but this kind of snapshot analysis um, really makes these things independent. We're, we're saying in January 2015, this is what it looked like in January 2016, this is what we lo it looked like. We kind of, it's like we're doing this time sub, we're, we're doing this time um, selection set first, and then we're just doing a traditional spatial analysis. We're not really integrating time into the story. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another thing that we see a lot is my favorite, which is flashing points on and off on a time slider. Super useful. Um, I'm sure you've all now learned what the 18 months of 911 calls, the patterns, how they change. You're thinking, show me that again. So a lot, I'm seeing more and more people are talking about time and we're dealing with it by doing things like animations. And the time slider is super valuable and we'll talk a little bit at the end about how we can use it to visualize the results of our analysis. But flashing on tens of thousands of points one after another, I don't think anyone would argue with me, even the people that built the time slider, that that isn't useful. Um, it's really hard to tell at the end what happened at the beginning. We kind of lose our perspective, it's hard to remember what you, even the, the map right before it looked like. Um, so we really wanted to think about how do we integrate time more? How do we bring time um, into the equation? So Flora and I went to a one of the perks of working in Redlands um, is that uh, some random Wednesday afternoon, Waldo Tobler comes and gives a lecture which we got there half an hour early for and sat in the front row. Like, I was like, we got to get there early. It's going to fill up. 
<laughs> it, there was a lot of people there, but we were a little, I think, overzealous with how excited we were about it. Um, so Waldo Tobler is the kind of guy who wrote the original paper. It was a 1970 paper where he said that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. It's, the, it's what we learn in kind of our Geography 101 class as the first law of geography. Um, and he was talking about that paper a little bit, and I asked at the end, you know, it was opened up for questions. It's the reason we got there early, so we could be the ones in the front row asking questions. And um, I asked, you know, you didn't know, of course, when you wrote this paper in 1970, you didn't write the first law of geography. You, it was just a sentence in your paper, but it became the first law of geography. So if you knew then what you know now, which is that you were writing this Tobler's Law, would you change anything? What would you change? Um, and he said, everything is related to everything else, but near and recent things are more related than distant things. And I was like, it's like you read my mind. It was like epiphany. It was so exciting because what it, what it said was that we were kind of on the right track and the things that we were thinking about, about how we extend spatial statistics to incorporate time just made perfect sense. We've really always thought and always um, taught the way that we think about the spatial stats tools is that there are this implementation of Tobler's law. It's, it's incorporating this law into the way that we do our analysis, that things that are close together are more related than things that are farther apart. So for him to say that he would extend the law to incorporate time, it's just like that's exactly what we're doing. So that's kind of how you can think about it. We are extending what it means to be near, what it need, means to be sp spatially related, to be both spatial and temporal. So now things are spatio-temporally related. And that really, and it, what's also really cool about this is it means that we can extend meth methods that are really familiar to us really simply by just adding this, this component to it um, and still be able to answer questions that are really important and that, that we kind of know really well how, how to answer. It also opens up a whole new sort of questions that are very unfamiliar to us. Um, and as we grow, we're going to be growing more kind of traditional time series tools um, and that sort of thing. But to start, we focused on extending some of our existing tools to really integrate time into them. And the way that we, we did that is by building the tools in the space-time pattern mining toolbox. So what you're looking at here is the result of an emerging hotspot analysis um, and a 3D visualization of it where we're visualizing what we call a space-time cube. And we're going to spend all afternoon, well, at least this section, talking about how we create a space-time cube, what those tools do, how it really is just an extension of what we learned um, before lunch and how the kind of traditional hotspot analysis and traditional outlier analysis tools work. So with that, Janora is going to take over and talk about the tools and how they work and some of the gotchas. Okay, so the first step in um, in order to get our data into this type of format where time is really integrated, um, truly integrated into our analysis, we will need to create a space-time cube. Now there's um, two tools that can do this. Um, and really, which tool you use just depends on the format that your data is in. So the first tool that we're going to talk about is the Create Space-Time Cube by Aggregating Points tool. And um, pretty obvious in the name of the tool, this tool is going to create a space-time cube by aggregating points or your incidence events into a cube. Um, so it's going to create um, these space-time bins and aggregate your incidents into those space-time bins um, and also summarize any attributes that you may have about those incidents into those bins as well. So let's illustrate this. Um, traditionally, when we display our data on the map, um, it's in two-dimensional two space, right? So we have the set of points, and there's an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, um, and we put it on the map and we can kind of see the pattern, right? Um, but like we saw with that Baltimore 911 call data, it's just a lot of data, right? And it's really impossible to see what's going on by just either putting it on the map or animating through time. So with the space-time pattern mining tools, what we're essentially doing is treating time as that third dimension. So just another dimension that we can use to define what it means to be near. 
So what this Create Space Time Cube tool is doing is um, really just aggregating that data into what you can think of as uh, not only a, a spatial grid in 2D, but also a temporal grid in 3D. And this is kind of in, in my head. This is, when I saw this picture, it really helped me visualize and kind of see what this uh, space-time cube actually was. Um, so you can kind of think about it like this. And we know, after running this tool, we know how many points fell within each one of these bins in the cube. You can see the cute little points <laughs> peeking out there. <laughs> Hello. Um, so we know how many points, how many incidents happened um, in that space-time location. And we also might want to know either the sum or the average um, of a set of values associated with those points that fell into each one of those bins. Um, so when we're creating the cube, there's some parameters to think about. Um, you have to think about the scale spatially, the scale of that grid spatially, but then also that, the scale of that grid temporally. So for instance, in this example, this cube is a one kilometer by one kilometer by one month, uh, one month bin, right? And you have complete control over, over these. It can be a week and a mile or um, any other combination of spatial and temporal inter intervals that make sense for your analysis. Uh, so at this point, you've heard me use the term bin a couple times. Um, so I just want to take a second and um, define a couple of key terms uh, that we use when talking about the space-time cube, just so that we're all on the same page going forward. So each block of space and time within the space-time cube, we call a bin. Um, a column of bins that share a same spatial location is called a, um, a <laughs> that share the same spatial extent is called a location. Um, so they share the same spatial extent on the ground, but then have different temporal uh, extents. And this is essentially time series information, right? So when we create the cube, we end up with time series information for each location in our, in our cube. Uh, the rows that share a temporal extent, we call a time slice. Um, and like Lauren was just talking about, these, these time slices in a lot of ways are just the way that we've, already, uh, that we've always done temporal analysis in GIS, right? They're snapshots. So you can compare one snapshot to the next snapshot um, over time, which is valid and useful. Um, but in doing it that way, like Lauren was saying, we're saying that each time slice is independent. It kind of exists in a vacuum. It has nothing to do with what came before it, and it has nothing to do with came, what came after it. Um, it just, they're completely independent of different of the other time slices, right? But the space-time pattern mining tools um, are really integrating time in a tighter way, uh, with the time slices being interrelated in, in a 3D structure like this. So when you run the tool, um, the first thing we do, like I said, is aggregate, and we count up all the points, all the incidents that fell within each bin. And after we run the Create Space-Time space Cube tool and done this aggregation, we can kind of already uh, see and kind of start to understand our data a little bit clearer, a little bit better when you, do, when you view the data in this 3D way. And you can kind of start to visualize the patterns in your data that you wouldn't be able to see uh, otherwise, if you're just flashing your points on and off the map, um, or just like putting all the points on the map. Um, like I mentioned, you also have the option to aggregate any attributes that you have associated with those points, um, and you're able to create what are called summary fields. So not only counting up the number of points within each bin, but then also summarizing any attributes that you have associated. So maybe you have um, online customer sales data, and you're not only interested in when and where those sales occurred, but the value, the sales dollars um, also. So, so you can average the sales dollars into each bin. And there's a number of different ways that you can uh, calculate these summary fields. You can take the sum, the average, the standard deviation um, for any attribute that you want to calculate. So when you do analysis on the cube, um, one of the more important pieces that you're doing when you're running an emerging hotspot analysis or a local outlier analysis or even just creating the cube in the beginning is trend analysis. Um, and this gets back to the importance of those locations and that time series that information that we have for each location in the cube. Uh, so the statistic that we've been using for trend analysis is called the, Men the Man Kendall statistic. And one of the requirements of this statistic is that you have a complete time series. So you can't have any empty bins. We can't just pluck out two of those bins and um, do a trend analysis. It doesn't work that way. You need a complete time series. So 
what do you do if you do have empty bins? We have to fill them in. Um, so if I'm looking at crime or water usage and um, I, have, I have a location that has data, 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 then missing data, and then data continuing on that, on from there, I have to make a decision. What does it mean that there were no points that fell into a bin at that time and place? So if I'm aggregating and I'm looking at crime incidents, the fact that no incidents fell into that bin probably means that there was no crime at that time and place, right? So I could choose to fill in with zeros. However, that might not always be what you want to do, right? If we're looking at um, average home sale values, and you have value, value, uh, no home sales, so there's no value, and then values continuing on from there, is zero the right answer? Should we fill, it was the average home price zero at that time? Probably not. There were just no home sales. Um, or if you were aggregating water usage and you have value, value, missing value, and then value is continuing on from there, um, was there no water usage? Or maybe did the sensor stop working so it's not truly a zero? Um, so we have a couple other ways that you can think about filling in your empty bins. You can fill in empty bins um, based on spatial neighbors. So we find the spatial neighbors for that empty bin, and then we just use the average of those neighbors to fill it and replace that null with the average of those spatial neighbors, essentially imputing or estimating the value at that location based on its spatial neighbors. Um, you can use space-time neighbors. So with space-time neighbors, we're looking ahead and behind that empty bin, as well as using all of the spatial neighbors. Um, and it's going to give you a little bit smoother of an estimate just because we're using more information uh, to, to get that average and fill in that bin. You can also just use your temporal neighbors, which is essentially interpolation over time. So if you had value, value, missing value, and then value continuing on, we essentially just fit, we use a, a, a method called spline, and we fit a line to that, and wherever that empty bin falls along that line, we use that, we use that value to fill that empty bin. It's worth, oh, did I? I got it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So with this uh, temporal neighbors method, it's really important to note that you need to have the um, first two bins full of values and the last two bins full of values because we're interpolating between those two points. We're not extrapolating your data, so we're not going to go past any data you have. So it's really important to have that start and end point so we can, um, so we can use that time series to fill them in. Okay, so time. Um, time sounds like it might be just easy to in integrate time, <laughs> but often um, it gets really tricky, really, really tricky. It's the exciting part about the space-time pattern mining tools, but it's also kind of the more complicated part also. So we have this timeline, and we have data along this timeline that runs from March 22nd, which happens to be Flora's birthday, <laughs> to April 16th, which happens to be Lauren's birthday. <laughs> and we have this beautiful data set in between. So if we're going to start thinking about how to aggregate this data set temporally. Let's say we want to aggregate it into uh, one week, right? Do we start at the first data point and kind of march forward? So it's going to be like the 22nd to the 29th to um, to wherever. Do we start at, or do we start at the end and kind of march backwards? And then what happens if it doesn't actually aggregate? It's not evenly broken up by weeks. What happens with that extra time? Do we have one bin that's just half, we can't just have one bin that's a half a week, but we can't have a partially empty bin either. Um, so it's really important to think about what happens with this extra time and what happens if um, we can't chunk up our data evenly like that. Um, really important to think about the implications on our analysis also. And this problem is what we call temporal bias. Um, and it's just one of the more critical things that you have to think about when uh, creating your space-time cube, and one of the more important decisions that you have to make um, is dealing with this temporal bias. So, um, you don't actually have to make that decision because we do have a default. Our default is end time. So with end time, we're going to start at the, the most recent data point and kind of chunk backwards in time. So our last data point is April 16th, and in this example, we've chosen a, a time step of four days. So it's going to go from the 16th to the 13th, and then the 9th, and then back to the 5th, until we get to the last time period, which starts on the 23rd, 
but it actually uh, goes all the way back until the 19th. But you can see that our data stopped at the 22nd, right? So that last time bin extended past our data, which ends on the 20th, and we actually have two full days <clears throat> that are included in that time block, but I don't actually have data in my data set. And what's going to happen is that last, thank you, <laughs> that last time interval, it's going to look like it has a lot less incidents that happen there. But in reality, I just wasn't collecting data before the 22nd, right? And this is essentially temporal bias in our aggregation structure. So because we now have a period in time that looks, half, that looks low, but it's really just half empty. This happens a lot more than you think. I mean, it's really, we, I think the reason that, you know, Janora is saying time's the hard part. And the truth is, the reason we feel that way is because we're geographers and we've been thinking about space for decades. And we get to time and we're like, whoa, all the same, all the ways that geography is complicated. You know, I'm working on my dissertation and it's about these tools. And I have a section on the modifiable temporal unit problem, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. So now we're talking about both in the same place, right? We have the modifiable aerial unit problem, we have the modifiable temporal unit problem, and we're putting it all together in one big cube. So in a lot of ways, I think if you think about this like you would think about geography, you just have to kind of flip it and think about time, of course this matters, right? If you created a grid and if you were aggregating and you created a grid and you noticed that on one side of your data set you have this whole row of empty, you'd know that that is going to have an impact on your analysis, right? So it's kind of the same idea with time. Okay, we can also use start time. So we start at the beginning of the data and go the other way. But even doing this, um, it doesn't get rid of the bias, it just puts it on the other end, right? Um, so we chose to make end time the default, and we made that decision because uh, most often when we're doing analysis, we're interested, we're more interested in what's happening right now, right? So if I had to pick where to put the bias, I would put it at the end, or at the beginning, right? Not in the most recent time periods. But of course, if I had a choice, I would choose no bias, right? And so there's some things you can do. Um, when you create a cube, we give you a report with information about the temporal bias and things like that. You can kind of subset your data so that it does fall evenly um, within your uh, spatial and temporal scale if you want. Um, but it's just really, again, an important thing to think about the implications that it might have on your analysis. Like in this example, if you go back to the, I would, I would never do start time personally, but we, it's there in case you wanted to. But if we we're doing end time and this was happening and we had this bias, what we would probably do is cut off everything before the 24th. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're impacting our analysis way worse by having a half full beginning. Because if we're looking at trends and the beginning is falsely half full, that's going to tell us that there's been more of an increase than is truly real. It's going to be this false increase. I mean, granted, it won't be that bad because that trend analysis isn't just doing like a, a difference where it takes the last period and it takes the first period and it subtracts them. It's truly looking for a trend. So if there isn't a meaningful trend throughout, it shouldn't, it, it, it won't be as impactful as if we were just doing a difference between the first and the last, but it, it will make a difference. So if you just drop the ones that kind of fall unevenly in your group and, and cut off those two days worth of data, now you'll have full full time periods, full bins. The alternative would be to pick a, a way to chunk it that cuts it off evenly, right? But most of the time, the reason you're chunking it the way you are is meaningful, more meaningful, and you want to keep those chunks the right size and you just get rid of a couple of days worth of data or, or weeks or months, whatever the case may be. The only other thing I want to add is um, you also have to be careful about uneven time breaks. So if you're doing it monthly, some months have 31 days, other months have 28 days, and those Februarys are going to have three whole days less data than the January right before it. That's the other thing that's kind of... That's a really yeah. important part. Really important Everyone part. wants to use months, and of course we have months in there, but like, do you really want to use months? <laughs> Just think about that. It sounds good. It's very messy, though. I mean, weeks are okay, but months and actually years are 
a little messier. When we started doing this, at some point we were like, oh my gosh, we have to deal with leap years. Because <laughs> that those are they're real days. They have a day in a leap year that have to be accounted for. But you're not thinking about that when you say, you know, look at my 10 years worth of data, but it's in there. So you do have to think about those uneven periods. You you might be better off doing like a 30 day chunking than a, a one month chunking. <coughs> Okay, so spatial aggregation options. Um, so you can aggregate spatially into a fishnet grid. Um, we added the option to um, aggregate into a hexagon grid. And new in Pro 2.0, you can actually aggregate into defined locations. So if you're aggregating your crime incidents, um, Totally fine to aggregate into a fishnet grid or a hexagon grid cube, but it might be more meaningful to your analysis to aggregate those crimes into police feeds. Or if you're looking at um, you know, online sales data, maybe you have sales territories, you can aggregate into those um, defined locations that you provide to us um, if you want as well, which is very exciting. So that leads me to the next create space time cube. And this one is create space time cube from defined locations. And this one is going to um, structure your panel data, station data, um, your data where the geography is not changing, but the attributes are changing over time. So maybe you will have sensors um, that are collecting readings. Those sensors aren't moving, but the attributes, the, the readings that you're collecting are changing over time. Or if you're looking at um, data at the census block level, um, the census blocks don't change very often. Um, so that geography isn't changing, but maybe population or obesity rates within, that, within those census blocks are, are changing over time. So let's say we have sensors recording data in various locations. Um, they're collecting data at regular intervals. Um, so previous to this create space time cube uh, from defined locations cube, excuse me, Create space time <laughs> from defined locations. Previous to this new tool, um, you would have been forced to aggregate um, into a grid and basically summarize the values of those different sensors into each cell by either summing or averaging or taking the max value from each sensor um, in, into the grid. So with the new tool, each sensor becomes its own location. Um, without any spatial aggregation. Um, and you can choose to either make each reading its own bin, so no temporal aggregation, or you can also choose to, to aggregate temporally. So in this example, um, the sensor is taking readings every 30 minutes, and we've decided to aggregate into uh, one hour time, time bins, right? But again, if you're aggregating, you need to be mindful and watch out for uh, temporal bias. So also with this tool, um, your data can either be one set of features, like a feature class with the shape information and a related table. You're storing your attribute information into a related table. Um, or you can have repeating shapes contained within that same feature class. So each, um, each reading contains the sensor location and the reading and the time. Um, and those, those sensor markings or sensor names get repeated within the feature class. Um, or maybe you have um, counties and you are repeating the, the, the county ID with each with each reading at each time period. And these were kind of the two ways that we've seen people have this kind of data. I, I think you guys would probably agree that that's kind of, the, these are two of the main ways that, that people have their data. One is that you have them repeating and having them repeating isn't ideal. Like in the example of the, these are, are counties across the US, you have repeating counties. And so if there's 3,000 counties and you have 10 years worth of data, you have 30,000 polygons in your data set. You repeat the 3,000 10 times, essentially, with new data each one. So each one has a, a timestamp. Um, you have to do that, for instance, if you want to use a time slider. So a lot of people do have their data in that format so that they can bring it into ArcGIS and take advantage of it. Then the alternative is you just got that one shape and then you've got the related table. We know that there's a third way, which we originally were thinking about um, directly supporting in the tool, um, which is that you've got your you've got a set of counties, let's say, and instead of having them repeat or a related table, you have columns for your date time. So you've got income 1990, income 1991, income 1992. So your, your temporal data is held in columns. Um, there isn't 
a direct way to do that, but there are some tools that will let you kind of flip that data around, and we have those workflows. There's a tutorial. There's a tutorial. Quite lovely. That walks through exactly <laughs> how to take your data from that column format, put it in so that they're rows and have, they have date times, and lets you go through the, the analysis that way, which we know is important. Lots of people do have their data that way. Um, I just wanted to mention um, the other brand new tool that we have in uh, Pro 2.0 is a tool called Fill Missing Values. Um, and we built this tool to just give users a little bit more flexibility in how they fill their empty bins or in how they estimate their null values um, beyond what the Create Space Time Cube tools uh, already give you. So there's lots of different options. It doesn't only work on temporal data. You can have purely spatial data. Um, if you have nulls, you can use this tool to interpolate, to estimate and replace those null values um, based on uh, the setting. There's a lot of options. There's, um, a lot of options in, in, what you ch in how you decide to fill in those missing values. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Flora, and she's going to show us how these tools work in action. Cool. Um, oh. oh, yeah. Sorry, here. No. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I won't. always got to have a mic. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> All right, let's create some space time cubes. Um, so here I have a data set. These are school districts, and we have information for every school district about the childhood poverty rate. So a very serious, very important problem. And we have um, this data set right here. It's just the shapes for the school districts. And then we have a related table with data for each of these school districts over 16 years. So. If we look over here, we have the same ID repeating 16 times. And if I scroll over a little bit and include the date, we can see um, in one year increments, we have the childhood poverty rate for every school district for 16 years. So we're going to use the new uh, Create Space Time Cube from Defined Locations tool. But really quickly, I just wanted to open up the old tool. Has anybody used the Create Space Time Cube tool? It used to be called just Create Space Time Cube, and now we have to change it. So a couple of people. So here, um, you know, the, the, everything is going to be really similar, except for we, we're going to lose those spatial aggregation properties. So with Create Space Time Cube by aggregating points, we give it a time step interval, but we also give it a distance interval. Um, but now that we're going to use these school districts themselves as the locations, we don't have to aggregate anything because every school district has a value in it already. So I'm going to use create space time cube from defined locations, which by the way is so exciting ever since we um, started with the space time pattern mining tools. Everybody's been asking about this and I've been really wanting to explore data that, you know, I. I I personally look at a lot of um, human behavior data, health data, that sort of thing, and it's usually already aggregated into some sort of political boundary. So it's really nice that we don't have to aggregate school districts into a fishnet grid anymore to analyze this sort of thing. So I am going to um, input my shapes here, so my California school districts, and I will save this. Um, so. Let me, actually I'm going to give this a name at the end and you'll see why in a second. Um, since I'm using a, a related table, I'm gonna need an ID, a location ID. So every school district has an ID and that's how I'm gonna link it to that related table. So I'll choose ID and I'll point to my related table and then point to that ID so that we can match those up. Now, if I wanted to aggregate temporally, I have the data um, one value per year for 16 years. Let's say I had this monthly. I could use temporal aggregation here, give it the time field and say um, aggregate it into years for me from the monthly. But I have it annually and I think that's a good scale so I'm not going to use the temporal aggregation here. I'm going to point to my time field and I'm going to tell it that I want to look at one year increments and then um, I have to tell it what the value is that we are analyzing, and that's going to be the percent poverty. And again, we have to deal with that problem of empty bins. So if we have empty bins for poverty, and I put a zero in there, that would probably be 
inc an incorrect choice. It'd probably be a bad choice. If we are missing data, it's probably not because there were no children in poverty during that particular time and place. It's probably because we didn't collect data. So I'm going to choose to fill with my space-time neighbors. And anything that's empty is just going to get smoothed out with the value of its averaging neighbors in space and time. And so you, you could have done this ahead of time, running fill missing values, where you'd have a little bit more control over how you fill in the missing values. We put it in here to kind of make it easy. You don't get to choose what we mean by space-time neighbors. We're going to choose for um, polygons we do K near, it's a K nearest neighbors, isn't it? It's really well documented exactly how many neighbors it's going to choose, and then we go backwards and forwards two time periods. So you don't have any control over that from this tool, but you do when you run the fill missing values tool. And now I'm going to give this space time cube a name. And the reason I left this last is because I have this bad habit of when I run things, giving them terrible names. Like, <laughs> My, if you look through my, if you look through the folders on my computer, it's all like test one, test two, test three, and I have no idea what they mean. After I run the tool, it's, you know, it's worthless for... Or hotspot one, yes. hotspot two. Group, grouping one, grouping two, those are all over my machine. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing with, you know, if I, if I name a layer test one, I can kind of like open that layer and see the shapes and, and open its attribute table or something. But with a net CDF, which is what we're creating by running this create space time cube tool, um, if I, if it just says test one, I'm not going to know which layer I created it from, which variable I'm looking at, how I aggregated it spatially, if there was spatial aggregation, how I aggregated it temporally, if there was temporal aggregation. So in order for this to be useful, you should give it a thoughtful name. So I'm going to call it um, California Poverty and maybe a uh, defined location, so I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> couldn't hurt. And then one year. Is and maybe space-time neighbors. Yes. Space, let's give it a space-time neighbor acronym. Mm -hmm. So very thorough, but you can come up with your own little system that works for you. And I'm going to run. So now we are kind of thinking of this related table. I mean, it's a related table, but I could have the polygons repeating on top of each other over and over and over. That's just a less efficient way to store your data. Um, but if you have it that way, then it would be fine too. But it's kind of, it's, it's looking at it in a third dimension and creating me a net CDF, which is all very exciting. So NetCDF is the way that we chose to store the space-time cube. It's a, um, how many of you guys are familiar with NetCDF? Okay. So we knew that that was kind of going to be the answer, not that many people, and that's cool. I mean, NetCF is a really commonly used um, format kind of in science and academia, much less so in GIS, um, but it's a really efficient way for us to store this kind of data. Um, so we used it, but we have done everything in our power to make it so that you do not have to learn about NetCDF at all. It should be as simple as it's just a file, you put it as an input, it all just works. We made it as easy as possible for you to visualize it inside of, of um, the tools which Floor is about to show you. So don't be scared away by the fact that it's creating a NetCDF file. It's just the best format for us to store it in. So now the tool has finished running. And it's a little anticlimactic because we're used to like having some sort of visual thing added to our map when we run a tool and it seems like not much happened, but a lot happened, I promise you. Um, one way to confirm that is by looking at the messages window. And with most of the spatial stats tools, probably maybe all of them, it's really nice to take a look at this messages window. I have to admit that before I worked for Esri, I really rarely, if maybe ever, looked at the messages window when I ran a tool, but we give you, we, we think so much about what to put in here. Like, we spend hours in meetings yes. talking about how to word what the messages tell you in here because we want you to understand it um, and to have the information. So, in here, it's going to tell me that we had 16 time steps. It's going to tell me that we did one year chunks and had an end time step alignment. It's also going to tell me the number of estimated bins. Lots of great information about um, the cube. If we have an overall direction and trend, and we do see that overall we are increasing our child uh, poverty rates, which is unfortunate. Um, another way to 
kind of confirm that this has worked is to... <laughs> you don't need to confirm it's worked, guys. It's worked. <laughs> you want to visualize the results of you the... Know, visualization is actually a really important part of analysis because yeah. I could run this, but if I can't see it, how, how am I going to interpret it? How am I going to work with it? How am I going to explain it to you? So I'm going to visualize it. Um, and we can use some of the other space-time pattern mining tools in the utilities tool set to um, visualize this in 3D. So I'm going to turn it over to a scene, and I'm going to run Visualize Space-Time Cube in 3D, and I'm going to point to that really nicely named cube that I put somewhere that's not here. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, <laughs> but you know go what? To the I have... history. No, don't do that. <laughs> How many of you guys know about the geoprocessing history? Nah, yeah, that's, that's... So if you don't know about the geoprocessing history, we're about to rock your whole world. If you go to the catalog window or the project pane, this exists in ArcMap 2. There's the geoprocessing history. It has every tool you've run. It saves it. it. If you click on it, it'll reopen it with all those parameters filled in. It's a great way to go back and see what you did. I often find myself a month later coming back to a project and being like, what was I doing last time I was here? And you just open up the geoprocessing history and you've got a, a really clear view of what you did. Something else that I try to do sometimes when I have time is to go through and when I'm done kind of delete the things that were kind of steps that maybe I tried and didn't work out so that what's left in there is really the workflow that, success, that was successful for me so that when I do come back because we're all doing 50 different things I can look at it and know exactly what worked well for me the last time I was kind of in that project doing that kind of analysis. And when you're sharing these, so I actually got this demo from Lauren, and I had to go through her geo geoprocessing history to understand, well, how did she aggregate by time, did she not? So um, that was helpful for me. Mo mainly helpful for me, because I didn't have to tell you. <laughs> yes, but I wouldn't have known either. <laughs> but you didn't clean this one up for me. There was no, a I Chicago didn't. Data I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. So I ran Visualize uh, Cube in 3D, and um, we got a layer here. It's always good to go to the Appearance tab and uh, clear the visibility range limits, because we, we have that default limit because not everyone has a powerful enough graphics card. I mean, any graphics card is going to max out at some point. Um, so we have that default on, but you can easily clear those limits. And now we can visualize, OK, we have a time series column at every school district. And if I kind of zoom in here, we can investigate, OK, in this school district, if I click on this bin, we'll see that um, between January 1st of 2014 and January 1st of 2015, the um, average uh, poverty rate was 31%. And we have that for our whole study area. And now that we've aggregated this, so now you can think of this as just a core plus map in 2D. So if we had... Um, been doing this in, if I had just made a core plus map of uh, school districts and their overall poverty rate or their rate for one year, it'd be kind of equivalent to how we think of this. And so we know, if, especially if we were in last session, that there is some subjectivity in core plus maps. Doesn't mean that they're wrong, but we can take this a step further and actually analyze, do we have any significant clustering in these values that I'm, that I'm visualizing right now? So um, we're going to learn how to do that with emerging hotspot analysis. Okay. So after we've created a space-time cube, we can run some of the other space-time analysis tools on this cube to really start to dig in and explore um, some of the spatio-time patterns spatiotemporal patterns that exist in your, in your data. So emerging hotspot analysis is um, one of these tools. And what it does is it really, it, it, it just extends the hotspot analysis tool that we talked about in the last session, the session before lunch. Um, so it's, it's essentially a space-time interpretation of the Geddes Ord GI star statistic. So let's look at how that works. Um, so we have our aggregated cube with the most recent events on top and uh, the older events at the bottom. And in our previous session, we looked at the concept that we can define a neighborhood in space. And we can see that here. So this is how the traditional hotspot analysis works. 
Um, but now instead of just defining the neighborhood in space, we're also defining the neighborhood in time. So we're looking at each bin in relation to both its spatial neighbors and its temporal neighbors going backwards in time. So now a point or event is, only related, uh, is not only related to features that happen nearby in space, um, and also within your specified temporal neighborhood. And we go through the cube bin by bin, and each bin is analyzed in relation to its space-time neighbors. And we're asking that same hotspot analysis question. Is this neighborhood significantly different from the rest of the study area? And if it's significantly higher, it's marked as a hotspot. And after going bin by bin throughout the entire space-time cube, what we end up with is really um, just a traditional hotspot analysis result, right? Except for it happens to be in 3D, and it's taken into consideration not only your spatial neighbors, but also temporal neighbors in your cube. But it's still just statistically significant hotspots and cold spots, right? It's still a lot of information. So the output of the tool um, to help with this interpretation of, of the, this hotspot analysis results, um, we, we're going to categorize each location based on the hot and cold spot trends over time for each location. So we're categorizing each location into one of these 17 categories on the left-hand side that summarize the, the trends at each location in the cube. And it's really useful to look at the 2D and the 3D results together, I find. So um, we put the 2D result on top of the 3D cube. And you can see that the categories, you can see more obviously that the categories really are just a summary of what's happened at that location over time. So if we look at this location in the front corner, um, that one has been marked a sporadic hotspot. And you can see that it was hot at the beginning, and then, then nothing, and then hot again, then nothing, then hot again. So it's kind of on and off. Um, Sporadic, right? Sporadic hotspot. The location next to it has been categorized as a new hotspot. And if you look at what's been going on over time, it's been not significant until the last time period when it was hot. So it was marked an, a, a new hotspot. So let's see how emerging hotspot analysis works. OK. Now that I've aggregated my data, I can analyze it. So I want to run a hotspot analysis on this space-time cube. So what I'm going to do is go to Emerging Hotspot Analysis. And again, I'm going to have to input that space-time cube. So I'm going to have to remember what it was called and also where I put it. <laughs> but luckily, I copied it, so I can just paste that back in there from the results window. Uh, my analysis variable is going to be um, the poverty rate, the, the child poverty rate. I'll give my output features a slightly better name, Emerging Hotspot Analysis 1. Um, it's a great name. <laughs> just in case I already had Emerging Hotspot Analysis <laughs> in that database. Um, and then I'm going to accept the defaults and run the tool. So I could choose um, how, how I want to conceptualize these spatial relationships. Or I could accept the defaults that the tool chooses for me by looking for different peak distances, et cetera. So the default output for emerging hotspot analysis is in 2D. And let's look at it in the 2D map. OK, so we see here that we have this um, really long legend, a lot to make sense of. Um, but the reason that we did this was because if we gave you this result in 3D, then it would be almost impossible to understand because every single bin is going to have a level of significance. It's either going to be one of uh, three levels of hot significance, 90, 95, or 99, three levels of cold, or not significant. So if we're looking through hundreds of thousands of millions of bins, we're not really going to understand this without digesting it in some way. So that's what the 2D output is doing. So if we take a look over here, we're seeing a lot of intensifying hotspots. And intensifying hotspots, that means that that location, so that school district, has been significantly hot at least 90% of the time over those 16 years. And that z-score has been getting more and more intense, stronger and stronger. So it's getting hotter and hotter. The problem is getting worse. So this is. Uh, not a good sign over here. If we, if we zoom down a little bit over here, we see what we call oscillating hotspots. So that means that in the most recent time period, they were hot, but in the past, they have been cold before. 
So maybe it was cold for a while, not significant, and then it ended up hot, or maybe it was cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot. Um, but to really understand what it was, we can visualize this in 3D as well. So I'm going to go back to the Visualize Spacetime Cube in 3D tool. And I'm going to input my same cube, which I'm going to have to recopy from my <clears throat> geoprocessing history. the right one no all right create space time cube from defined locations and go back to visualize in 3d wait no, it's not going to work is it okay so we are in Georgia common data sorry about this guys and we're just going to use this one. All right, the cube variable and our display theme is hot and cold results. So with um, the space-time cube, whenever we run an analysis, it gets written back to the original cube. So I created the space-time cube by aggregating um, into those defined locations, and I have those values now stored in the cube. Once I run an emerging hotspot analysis, it's now also going to store the, the z-scores and the p-values and significance of the hotspot analysis results in with your cube. And if I were to run emerging hotspot analysis on it again, it would overwrite the last result. So I drew this in the map, but it's definitely more useful in the scene. So I'm going to copy this over. And we'll clear our limits. And now we can visualize um, this in 3D. And so if I put these side by side and link my views, so if I go into view, link views. Now I can kind of navigate these together and get a better understanding of what's happening at each one of these school districts. So if I zoom in down here, I can see these intensifying hotspots and I can confirm what they mean by looking at the individual bins. I see that they have been hot um, for at least 90% of the time and that z-score has been getting hotter. Um, another cool thing about running the uh, Visualize Spacetime Cube in 3D tool is that we automatically generate a time series chart for you. Um, same thing when I, when I visualize just the counts, but if I look at the time series chart for the um, hotspot analysis results, we see how the z-score has changed um, over time. So we see that um, it, there was like a very large increase over several years here. And then we can also interact with this. So if I want to take a look at this peak year, I can select it here in the chart and see where that falls in my um, 3D scene and see which time slice that corresponds to, which is pretty neat. And then one last way of looking at this, which I like with this type of defined locations cube, is if I put a 2D layer underneath with my results, I can kind of see them together um, without having to look at the side by side. So if I dock this back over here and zoom around a little bit, we can find um, maybe one of those oscillating areas, school districts. So, so we see that it, the most recently it was hot, but in the past there was a time period when it was cold. And so the, the 3D by itself w really wouldn't be very useful, but it's very useful in helping you understand the 2D result. And with this 2D result, we categorized this in ways that we thought would be useful. But if these categories are not exactly what uh, makes sense to the type of data or question that you're asking, you could uh, categorize these in a different way. So we've seen people kind of combine different chunks of these. So um, a consecutive hotspot and a persistent hotspot might be similar enough that you could just lump them into usually hot or something like that. Especially if you're giving this map as a result for a decision maker, 
if you hand them a legend like this, they might be intimidated by it or just not be interested in understanding it. So you can, this is like, of the result for an analyst, and then you're going to have to make some decisions in how you want to present this data and how how to translate these results to the people that need to understand them. The first time that I showed these tools to Jack um, in one of our director's briefings, I was so excited, and I showed them, look at all these categories, and I can learn everything there is to learn about this data, and he was just like, that's too many categories. And you know, I was of course immediately no, it's, ne it's never too many categories. Um, but then I kind of put on, I tried to look at it from his perspective as an executive, as a director, trying to just make a decision. You just want to know what's important. So like we've, I've done some work with um, World Resources Institute looking at deforestation. So looking at deforestation, first thing they did is drop all the cold spots because you can just get rid of eight categories right off the bat, and they don't care about cold spots and deforestation. All they care about are the hot spots. Um, but for instance, with um, intensifying, diminishing, and persistent hot spots, all three of those types, they're significant at least 90% of the time. Some of them, the z-scores have been increasing. Some of them, the z-scores have been decreasing. Some, they've had no trend, but they've all been statistically significant for 90% of the time. So. To them, that all just became kind of historical deforestation. Like, this has been happening, it's happening, it's still happening. Um, they kind of called out new and consecutive as something different, and they just lumped them together and changed the symbology. There's nothing magical about the categories we picked. We picked 90% because we thought that would be a good cutoff, but um, one of the things that WRI was talking about is that they only had 10 years worth of data, and you have to have at least 10 years worth of, or not 10 years, you have to have at least 10 time steps, whatever, however that breaks down. Um, and they were saying 90% was a little bit strict for them because it meant nine out of 10 of their time steps had to be significant. You know, if you're looking at 90% and you've got 200 time steps, 90 is not that bad. There's quite a few that we're not requiring to be hot. But nine out of 10 is quite a bit. So they would have said, you know, 60% of them would be enough for me to want to call it persistent. So the real statistical analysis happens when we do that space-time hotspot analysis. Um, the categorization of it is a lot more of kind of this art and science where we're trying, we tried to pick categories and create these categories that would be useful to you. But you do have to kind of put um, the hat on of, of, of what decisions are people going to be trying to make using this and how can I make this as informative as possible to those people and really kind of um, think hard about how to do that. Okay, so another way that we can analyze our space-time cube is to use the local outlier analysis tool. Um, and this tool is going to identify statistically significant clusters similar to hotspot analysis but um, what makes this tool special and cluster outlier analysis in general is that it's also going to find outliers um, in both space and time. So um, also a spatial temporal extension of um, a tool in the spatial statistics toolbox called cluster and outlier analysis. Um, and it uses the local, the Ansel and local <clears throat> Moran's I statistic. But again, we've extended it by integrating time. So the input is an aggregated cube. Um, and we're still looking at each bin, and we still have a neighborhood in both space and time, and a cube um, or a study area. But this time, we're removing the bin from the neighborhood, and we're asking two questions. We're asking, is this bin significantly different from all other bins? And is this neighborhood significantly different from all other neighborhoods? So again, we go bin by bin, evaluating the entire cube. Um, and in this case, there's going to be four possible outcomes. If the bin is higher than all other bins, and the neighborhood is higher than all other neighborhoods, then that bin belongs to a high, high cluster. And the same is true um, for the low values. If you have a low bin that is, um, if you have a bin that is lower than all of the other bins, and that's in a neighborhood that's lower than all other neighborhoods, uh, that bin is gonna be a low, low cluster. Um, but if we have a bin that is higher than all other bins, and that bin is in a neighborhood that's lower than all other neighborhoods, that bin is going to be marked as a high-low outlier. Um, and the inverse is true, too. So if you have a uh, 
been, did I start with high or low? Totally you said high. Lost. Okay, so you have a bin that is lower than all other bins in your queue, but it's in a neighborhood that's higher than all other neighborhoods, that bin is gonna be marked as a low high outlier. Okay, so the output for this tool is also a 2D map that categorizes each location based on uh, the cluster and outlier types over time, but there's quite a few less, quite a few fewer categories in this tool. Um, for instance, uh, that location in the front corner has been marked only high, high cluster. And if you look at what's been going on over time, it was not significant, then it was hot, then it was not significant, then hot, but it was only ever <clears throat> uh, part of a high, high cluster. And the location, this location has been marked as multiple types because you can see it's not been significant, uh, then it was cold, then not significant, then hot. So it's been multiple types over time. So let's see how local outlier analysis works. Okay, here we go. So, oh, I keep forgetting we're gonna put that in the mic. All right. So I'm gonna open up the local outlier analysis tool in the space time pattern mining toolbox. Point to my cube. Um, my analysis variable again is that poverty rate. And my output features, I'll call this uh, local outlier analysis. Um, so, for conceptualization of spatial relationships, for emerging hotspot analysis, I just accepted the defaults, but uh, you don't have to, and one of the things that I really like, one of the methods I really like is k-nearest neighbors, and it's great that it's included directly into this tool, uh, like whereas with the 2D hotspot analysis and cluster analysis, you would have to generate a, a weight matrix in order to use k-nearest neighbors, but here I can just say k-nearest neighbors and then change the number here. The default is eight, but I wanna say maybe look at 16. And then I also have the option here again to um, choose how many permutations I'm gonna go through. So I'm gonna do a lower number just because this is a, a demo and not a life or death decision. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to point out that, you know, here I did 16 nearest neighbors, but if I were really comparing these two, two analyses, I would have conceptualized the spatial relationships in the same way. But I just wanted to give you an example of how you can change that manually. And that's, these, this parameter is brand new. When we introduced the defined locations cube, where now we have polygons and points, we knew that we'd have to add a conceptualization of spatial relationships into this tool. Before you, with the original cube, you were limited to fixed distance because it was a grid and fixed distance is pretty good with a grid. Fixed distance on a grid, whether you have a, a distance or a number of neighbors, it doesn't really matter because they're exactly the same size all around. Um, but with polygons, it matters a lot. And being able to conceptualize spatial relationships on polygons is critical. So um, that parameter is now there. And that's true whether you have defined locations, cubes, or a regular grid cube. Um, and so this, this 2D result is pretty Again, it's, it's really hard, actually, I think, even harder to understand uh, by itself. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Lauren so that she can show you uh, a cool new way of visualizing this in 3D and getting a better understanding of this data and your results. OK, so Flora could have run just a the visualized space-time cube in 3D tool and created that, that visualization in 3D. Um, we created that tool so you don't have to learn about how 3D works. You don't have to learn a lot about net CDF files. We create a feature class for you out of it. We, it's automatically visualized in 3D and it should just work. But we want, there's a lot of things you can do with 3D to visualize this data in all sorts of ways. And we wanted to make that as easy as possible. So what we did is we built what we call the Space Time Cube Explorer. So if you go to esriurl.com slash Space Time Cube Explorer, which we have recently been calling Stacy. <laughs> S-T-C-E, sorry. <laughs> All the other teams have these like cool names for the projects they're working on and we just call our- The most big, literal thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we were really excited when one of our product engineers came up with Stacy. Um, Anyway, so we, you can download, it's an add-in for Pro and it's free obviously and you download it and you literally just double click on it and it installs and we've updated it with the releases. So there's a new one for Pro 2.0 which will help us look at both at a standard kind of 
gridded cube or a defined locations cube with polygon. So this is looking at that result from the analysis that Flora did where we have um, the local outlier analysis. So I was, of course, instantly interested in the result of this analysis because there's this really crazy high outlier and low outlier right next to each other. And they happen to be right, that low outlier is Redlands. <laughs> the high outlier is right right next to us um, in essentially in San Bern, includes some of San Bernardino. Um, so just a really interesting result and I wanna understand what that really all means. So what I'm gonna do is once I install the add-in, there's now this add-in tab and I launch the Space Time Cube Explorer. So essentially what I do is I point to my cube. So in this case, I've got California Poverty Analysis. I choose where I wanna put it. So this is gonna be my California Poverty and I'm gonna start by um, doing points and you'll see what I mean in a second. And I wanna look at my local outlier analysis results. Now I have some options for how I wanna output this. I can output it as points, which will be the centroids of my polygons, or I can output it as polygons. I'm gonna start with points. I'll show you polygons in a minute. So we will run that. And it's gonna do, essentially it's doing a lot of what the visualized space-time cube in 3D tool does. It takes that in that CF file, turns it into a point feature class, outputs it and, and allows us to visualize it. So right away we can start to see um, kind of what these high and low outliers. So we can see that this is a high outlier. It's been a high outlier, then it was nothing high outlier. And it's not really an outlier anymore, which on first glance seems like maybe that's a good thing. Um, but actually when we start to look at it, um, what we see is that's what, hap what happened was it was a high outlier and Redlands wasn't anything. And then all of a sudden this area with Redlands became a low outlier. And what was happening was all around it, and we can see that around here, only recently have these become hotspots, essentially. So they were, San Bern the San Bernardino area was a high outlier because it was surrounded by low poverty. But over time, the poverty around it has increased. So now it's not a high outlier anymore, and all of a sudden Redlands became a, a low outlier because everything around it became hotter. Um, so we can start to see some of those patterns, and it actually becomes uh, extra apparent if we look at, um, so I did, I did this also for the hotspot results. So if I point to my hotspot results, and I choose to look at them instead of as a value, but as um, hot and cold spot results, I can see that pattern also really clearly here, where it was cold, and then in more recently, everything kind of became hot around it. So what you'll what you probably noticed me just do is start flipping it between different ways of visualizing this data. So if we go back to our outlier analysis, we can look at it as our local outlier result over time, but I can use the explorer to actually change the way I'm visualizing my data. So I choose um, the layer in my map that I want to visualize, I choose the attribute, and then I have some options. So I can look, for instance, just at the values, um, and it's just gonna automatically change my symbology for me, or I can look at the results. I could even do, a, instead of just looking at all the results, I could filter by type, and what it's doing when I choose to filter by type is it automatically sets up a range slider for me. So I can go through here and look just at the high outliers, for instance, and see where those are and kind of filter them down that way. Um, I also have the option when I'm looking at a, um, when I'm using the Explorer, to let's say I go back to my hot and cold, but I want to, instead of looking at all of them at the same time, I want to look at a single time slice. So I can, what it just did for me there is set up the time slider for me. So automatically it's going to, and if I shut off the layer underneath it, so automatically it's going to show me, um, and I can play through this, and it's going to turn that layer on, those, those cells on one by one, and show me how the pattern has changed over time. Now it doesn't, if I'm going to do this, you're probably thinking I'd much rather look at that as polygons than the centroids. The centroids are great for when we're looking at um, 
The centroids are great for when we're looking at 3D. And the default is points, and we recommend points for 3D primarily because of performance. Visualizing a lot of polygons in 3D is visualizing a lot of data at one time, um, and you're going to want a really beefy graphics card to make that work. Um, so, but it is possible. So if I go in here and instead of points, I choose polygons and I run that, it's going to create a new layer for me. You'll see we actually tell you to switch to a map for better performance because with polygons, the thing we recommend most is if you want to use polygons, do it in kind of that time series way so that you can watch how the pattern's changing over time in a 2D map but it will visualize them in 3D um, if you choose not to put them in a, uh, in a map. So it's gonna go through and essentially it's creating a feature class where those polygons repeat because that's the only way we can get it to visualize all those polygons in 3D is with repeating polygons in a feature class. Now, we almost didn't give this option because of the requirements on graphics cards um, and just what the performance would be like. But, and not just that actually, the, the other thing is it's not all that useful to visualize them in 3D because they butt up against each other, guys. So you can't see inside the cube. So you're just looking at this pretty picture that's not really useful from an analysis perspective. And you'll see what I mean, you know, it looks cool but you can't see it, I can see inside of it as it's drawing, but once it draws, they butt up, it's just a big chunk of polygons that's killing your graphics card and you're not getting anything out of it. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, but the reason that we did it is because the one thing it is very useful for is explaining it to somebody. If you're trying to explain to somebody what a space-time cube is on polygons, this is a great way to do it. Anyone who sees this will just kind of automatically understand what we've done when we created the cube. So we know that you guys being able to explain this to somebody is really important. So we've done it so that you can, but from an analysis perspective, looking at them as the centroid is so much more useful from actually exploring the data perspective. But if I take those polygons and I put them into a, a map instead of a scene, then I can go into my explorer here, choose that layer, choose my attribute, and it's gonna set up the time slider for me. Perfect. <laughs> it's almost like the computer's telling me something, like, you are running low. So when I hit play, what it's going to do is it's going to um, show me how that pattern's changed over time. And we can start to see particularly some of the things that we were talking about as far as like the San Bernardino Redlands area where it wasn't that hot and it got kind of got hot over time. It's going to go really fast and super useful. It is actually here's one with hotspot analysis. and we can see each um, time period. I mean, this is actually a really depressing analysis. When we first ran this analysis, we were really sad because it's looking at the percentage of children in poverty, and we see it's a really, um, it's a really stark pattern that starts to emerge over the last decade or so where we see these hotspots of um, children in poverty really start to grow all over the state um, it just completely overtakes so many parts of the state. These are children between the ages of 5 and 17. Um, and actually, we started this analysis by looking at the entire country. And when we did that, the kind of story that it tells is... I mean, we were, on one hand, we were excited. This was kind of the first analysis we did once we finished the defined locations queue. And we've wanted to do 
space-time analysis on Polygon since the beginning. And so when we first ran, it was like, we can do it, it's amazing. And then we looked at this map and we were like, oh my gosh, all of these red ones are intensifying hotspots, places where the clustering, the intensity of clustering of childhood poverty is increasing over time. There's very little blue on this map at all. And the parts that are, are getting closer and closer to random. So they're, they're almost not even blue anymore. Um, so really powerful analysis that can be done when we kind of expand into um, looking at defined locations, cubes, but it's not limited to that, you know. The Explorer also lets us look at our um, 3D um, gridded cubes, which are still there and really powerful, and we can look at them in all sorts of ways. This is looking at power outages in Houston, you know, and we can explore our um, outages looking at the this is data from CenterPoint Energy looking, these are momentary outages over an 18 month period and we can start to see some of those patterns too. So not limited to polygons, you can still do all that aggregation. Now you can pretty much do anything you wanna do as far as space time pattern mining um, in terms of data formats and we're really excited really to see what you guys do with it and to see some of the amazing analysis that you do. We've seen some really great things come out of um, uh, some, we've gotten some really exciting emails where people show us the awesome analysis they've done, so we're looking forward to getting a lot more of those. So with that, we've got tons of resources. If you go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, um, we'll link you to the Space Time Cube Explorer. Um, we'll link you to all of our videos and slides. Um, we've got regression analysis left today. We go through the cluster analysis stuff again tomorrow. We do ask that you please fill out a course survey if you can. We really rely on them. They're very valuable to us. We don't get nearly as many as we used to because of it's on the app and not on paper. So if you have any time at all, we so appreciate that. We really do look at the feedback um, and value it very much. Um, so thank you very much. We'll see you in room eight next. Maybe.